Hello, everybody. This is the Pocket Passer. I'm your host, Randy Wyatt. I hope all of you are having a fantastic day. I know I am. I just got done with an excellent first week of NFL football from Thursday to Monday. A lot of good games. Even the Seahawks-Broncos game did not disappoint. Low scoring in the second half, but some very interesting turn of events coming out of that game. So a lot of stuff to dive into. The first thing I'm going to get into is my horrible weekend of predictions. I went 2-3 and three over the week. Started off poorly with the Bills-Rams game. So let's get right into that. Talk about what I thought I was going to see and just how wrong I was about it. So I thought the Bills defense would struggle with the absence of Jadavius White, and I thought the Rams would be able to run the football on him. I started Cam Akers in my fantasy league because I thought the Rams were going to be able to run the football on him. Cam Akers got three carries for zero yards, and those were his only touches of the game, as well as a play where he just decided not to block an incoming pass rusher on Matthew Stafford, looked at him, and then released out into the flat for Matthew Stafford to get absolutely laid out. Horrible term of events. I won that fantasy league, thankfully. But no thanks to Cam Akers and that Rams offense. The biggest thing was the Bills' run defense was a huge, huge surprise and a very pleasant surprise for everyone in Bills' mafia. If they can keep up that caliber of run defense, they're going to have an excellent season. And if the Rams' rushing offense is really that poor, they're going to have a long season. It's not going to be anywhere close to what I thought it was. They looked like a 13-4 and four caliber team to me over the offseason. But if they if they come out running the football like that week after week, they're not going to be the one seed, and they might not win the division. Thankfully for them, the 49ers were just as unimpressive against the Bears, but not a good performance. The Bills nearly doubled them in total yards. They more than doubled them in rushing yards, had over 100 more yards than them in passing yards, 101 more yards to be exact. And they had... Almost four more yards per play than them. 3.7 for the Rams, 7.1 yards per play for the Bills. Third down efficiency, the Bills were 9 out of 10, which is exceptional. They didn't even run nearly as many plays. as They ran eight less plays than the Rams because they just didn't have to. They only allowed two sacks, and the Bills' pass rush, which has been slowly improving over the last few seasons, was absolutely exceptional. They got after Matthew Stafford and took him to the ground seven times. I'm sure that pressure had somewhat of an effect on his interceptions. He throws the ball high, trying to look off a linebacker late in the game to Cooper Cup, and throws a flat-out inaccurate pass to his tight end early in the game for his first pick. I have a friend that turned the TV off immediately after seeing that play. It was about two minutes of watching, and then he's like, nope, that's enough for me, and I don't blame him. Uh, if, <laughs> if he wasn't as invested in the game as I was, just getting out of there at that point. It, The time of possession, pretty close, actually. 31 minutes for the Bills, 28, almost 29, basically, for the Rams. So close there, but turnovers. Actually, the Bills had more turnovers. Bills lost the turnover battle. They had four with two fumbles lost, as well as two interceptions. The Rams had the three interceptions. But the Rams' offense was obviously not able to capitalize on that. Ten points. And with four turnovers to work with, that's just an abysmal score. You'd really hope that the offense would be able to get something going. But between the pass rush, the run defense, and the secondary, really doing a great job to lock up the receivers. Cooper Cup obviously got his, had a really good game. But other than that, Bill's defense was excellent. Pass rush got after it. Run defense was exceptional. Cooper Cup, 13 catches, 128 yards, and a touchdown. Really good stat line from him. But that was really the only bright spot in a struggling Rams offense to start the season. Bills, on the other hand, Josh Allen, exceptional. I already talked about how they dominated rushing yards and in passing yards all around. Josh Allen threw two picks. His first one, not his fault, hit his receiver in the chest, and it bounced off into the linebacker, Bobby Wagner, for an easy interception for the Rams. Josh Allen also led the Bills in rushing 56 yards from him. Devin Singletary with 48 yards on eight carries. at six yards a carry, really promising stuff. From a lot of players for the Bills. Stefan Diggs, exceptional start to the season after a rough game against the Chiefs. Eight catches, 122 yards, and a touchdown. Gabe Davis, not slowing down at all from his great well, I guess he slowed down, but that was because he had four touchdowns against the Chiefs. So anyone would slow down after that. But still a good game. Four catches, 88 yards, and a touchdown. 
solid stuff from a lot of players. Zach Moss had six catches for 21 yards. There's a lot to like about this Bills team. It's a really well-rounded team. It's probably the most well-balanced Bills team we've seen. And if they can keep this up, they're going to continue to be the Super Bowl favorite. They're already the Super Bowl favorite. And for good reason, watch out for the Buffalo Bills because they just might roll darn near everyone in the league this year. So now going to my second game that I predicted, Packers-Vikings. I did well on that game, actually. I got it right. Not, not necessarily in the score prediction. I had the Vikings winning 28-24. The Packers offense was just in hibernation. Absolute snooze fest from them. They got into the red zone and turned the ball over on downs twice. And if that doesn't happen, it's a completely different game. And they got stopped on fourth and goal from the one. And it just, I mean, getting stopped on fourth and the goal does what getting stopped on the fourth and goal does. It kills your momentum. You don't come away with points. And then to make matters worse, the Vikings pretty much immediately got out of there uh, and marched down the field, I do believe. So Aaron Jones, only five carries. He was the leading rusher, 49 yards rushing. He had 9.8 yards a carry, which is very impressive. But the man who had the most touches on offense was A.J. Dillon. He had, he led the league, like, sorry, <laughs> he led the team in carries with 10 for 45 yards, a very solid four and a half yards a carry. And then he also led the league in receiving yards and in receptions. He had five catches for 46 yards. So if that's going to be your leading receiver, a lot of concern there. A lot of concern. Very, 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 very subpar performance from receivers. Christian Watson, the rookie, just crushing drop on the first play from offense. A perfect throw from Rodgers that would have been a 75-yard touchdown. They don't get it done, and from there, the Packers' offense just seemed to not be able to get out of their own way. The Vikings' pass rush was after them. New additions to Darius Smith, the former Packer, got a sack on Rodgers. He played well, and that entire Vikings' defense was just all over the Packers' receivers. Rodgers was sacked four times, which is the most he's been sacked since 2020. They were without David Bakhtiari, who they've been without for about a year and a half now, close to a year and a half. They were without Elton Jenkins today. They were without him pretty much the entire season last year. And they missed those two linemen without a doubt. They were also without Al Lazard, their most experienced wide receiver, who's going into either his fourth or fifth year with Green Bay. I would imagine he would have been able to do a little better than what those rookie receivers were able to do in their first performance in a regular season game, especially since Rodgers did not play at all with them in preseason. And on offense for Minnesota, Dalvin Cook, 20 carries for 90 yards, four and a half yards of carry. Really good game from him. Kirk Cousins played lights out, 23 of 32 for 277 yards and two touchdowns. And the highlight of the entire game, without a doubt, the leading receptionist, the leading receiver, the leading, he caught both touchdowns. Justin Jefferson had an exceptional game, nine catches, 184 yards. 20.4 yards per catch and two touchdowns. The man was the definition of unguardable, wide open almost every time he ran a route, especially in the first half when he racked up the majority of his yards, the majority of his catches, and he had his two touchdowns there in the first half. I mean, you can't ask for a better game out of a wide receiver than what Justin Jefferson gave the Minnesota Vikings, the number one scorer in fantasy football as well. All around exceptional game. He won me two games in fantasy so that was nice having him uh really the only positive i can draw from justin jefferson's big game as a packer fan is that he did win me those two fantasy games because it was rough watching rogers 22 out of 34 195 yards and a pick the pick was kind of just i don't know throw up a prayer and hope you can get something going on offense because receivers were getting open offensive line couldn't protect them long enough and when there was someone open Rodgers pretty much made sure to get it to him for the most part, but it just didn't happen. The Minnesota Vikings defense came out swinging, and so did the offense. And if the Vikings can keep this up, they'll be one of the best teams in the NFC, so look out for them. Now, circling around to my third game that I predicted, the Chargers. I got that one right as well. I had the Chargers winning 20, 24. 31 to 27, I believe I had them winning or 31. I don't know what the score was, but I had them winning 
and they came out swinging the same as the Vikings did. The Chargers outplayed the Raiders. The Chargers got it done on defense with the three takeaways. And not having the game on TV, not being able to watch the whole thing, I was a little bit limited in some of my takes I could make. But all in all, very, very impressive performance by the Chargers. Three picks from the defense. They were able to get pressure on Derek Carr. They sacked Derek Carr, I believe it was six times. So Khalil Mack, the addition of Khalil Mack, Obviously paid off. He had three sacks, which is the most I'd imagine he's had in a while, a long time, on a team where Joey Bosa is having to be accounted for on the opposite side. That Chargers pass rush got after it, and the secondary made big plays, picking the ball off. And a lot of those, one of those picks at least was affected by the pass rush where the left tackle was pushing to Derek Carr's lap. He couldn't step into the throw. He had to stop his arm short, and the corner was able to jump the shallow crosser. I also saw he just underthrew a deep ball to Devontae Adams that got picked off. It was a great play by that outside corner to track the ball down and run under it and pick it off. And then his Derek Carr's first pick, I know I'm working from last to first, but his first pick was it looked like for some reason he didn't recognize a Tampa 2 coverage from the Chargers. Drew Tranquil dropped down underneath the seam route over the middle of the field. It's cover 2, so you like to attack the seams on the inside, but... Derek Carr failed to recognize that dropping middle linebacker. He dropped right into the window of the throw and got picked off there. So it's a really good defensive play and just poor use of eyes, I guess, by Derek Carr. I don't, it's something that I feel like he usually recognizes NFL quarterbacks that are good, like Derek Carr is, usually do a good job of recognizing things like that. Derek Carr didn't see it and the defense made him pay for it. So really a struggle game from Derek Carr. But I'll tell you who didn't struggle on that Raiders offense, Devontae Adams showing that Aaron Rodgers is not necessarily the reason. He's a great receiver. I'm sure he helped his development. But right now, Devontae Adams is not dependent on a good quarterback. Devontae Adams is who he is because his release is one of the best releases in the game. His route running is one of the best route running in the game. And he's got some of the best hands in the game. He's an exceptional player, and he's exceptional after the catch. He showed some incredible moves, making defenders miss in the open field to get extra yards. He's not one of those guys that's necessarily going to rip a big one underneath. Like he can just sh turn on the speed burners and just dust everyone. He's not going to do that, but he's going to make a lot of people miss and get extra yards that way. He's one of the best in the league at doing that. And he showed that once again in a Raiders uniform. Now it's not all Rogers, although a lot of it was Devontae Adams is that guy. And he's without a doubt, one of the three best receivers in the league. I think it's between him, Cooper cup, and Justin Jefferson, Take your pick. You really can't be wrong between those three guys. And it's about all I have for that. I mean, excellent pass rush from the Chargers. Justin Herbert put on a clinic. He is what he is. Justin Herbert, rocket arm, excellent job on several occasions, extending plays and moving outside of the pocket when he needed to, or just moving up in the pocket to buy himself a couple of seconds to deliver a perfect shot downfield, which I saw him do time and time again. It was all over the highlight reel, deep crosser, deep crosser, where he's just stepping up in the pocket, doing a great job buying time and just throwing the darts that he's known to throw. Gerald Everett, big game out of him at tight end. It's nice to see Gerald Everett kind of have the best game he's had really in a while. So the Chargers can keep wheeling there. Mike Williams, disappointing. He had a couple drops. Uh, which is something he's been known to do throughout his career. He has big games, and he has games where he just drops passes and doesn't make the plays. So if he need, if he can be more consistent, this Chargers offense is unstoppable. They had a nice run game from Kelly, as well as from Eckler. So dual running back threat, it looks like they might be having over there in L.A. And they were, without, the, without a doubt, the best L.A. team this weekend. Chargers were exceptional. So now... Another pick I got wrong, a one o'clock game. Browns, Panthers, thanks to the refs not calling a fake spike, uh, excuse me, intentional grounding on Jacoby Brissett because you can't fake a spike and then spike it. The Browns were able to kick a 58-yard field goal and win the game because of it. I don't think they hit that field goal if they call that penalty like they're supposed to. But that's just the cards the Panthers were dealt this week. Baker Mayfield... Did not have a great game, but he rolled him back down. Uh, good comeback from him. Miles Garrett got his, sacking his former teammate. And the Browns are the better team. 
there's not a lot to say about that game. It was kind of a and game. Kareem Hunt had a really good game, two touchdowns from him. So a lot of good stuff to see from the Browns that they're winning games without Deshaun Watson. If they can keep doing that, they have a good shot at making the playoffs. So that's definitely an encouraging thing for them. However, they're going to have to play better teams at some point in the season than the Panthers, who I really just don't love, to be honest. I mean, Baker Mayfield's a solid quarterback, but with that roster, the Panthers aren't going to win a ton of games. It's just not the way it's going to go for them. So good win from the Browns, but I feel like a lot of luck involved, uh, missed calls from the rest, but that happens every week for every team. So kind of goes either way. I don't know. It just feels eh to me. And my last prediction, which was without a doubt my worst prediction, I had the Cowboys beating the Buccaneers 27-17. to I wasn't necessarily wrong about the Buccaneers' offense. They were not incredibly impressive. They were able to move the ball pretty well. But when they got in plus territory, when they got in the red zone or close to the red zone, the Cowboys' defense and the Cowboys' pass rush especially stepped it up big time. Micah Parsons played excellent football. Leonard Fournette, I could not have been more wrong about him. I was hesitant about him because he came into camp overweight. But it's very clear that he fixed that problem very quickly because he balled out uh, on Sunday night, had an excellent game rushing the football. Tom Brady looked focused, looked dialed in. When he wasn't getting sacked, he was completing a lot of passes. He threw the ball really well for the most part. He threw the ball with impressive velocity. I've seen him throw some lasers, but the darts I saw him throw on Sunday night were some of the hardest passes I've seen him make in a while. So it looks like his arm has gotten stronger over the offseason. So, so much for the distractions. He looked fresh, and he looked ready to play some football. So the Buccaneers are going to be a good football team this year. I don't love Dallas, so let's see how they do against the better teams. But I do like Dallas's defense, especially with Micah Parsons out in the field. He's an excellent pass rusher. And the Buccaneers were able to get it done and absolutely shut down a Cowboys offense that although I did not have high expectations for because I did not buy the Zeke hype because they've been saying it every year, oh, he's back, and then he still performs below average. Oh, CeeDee Lamb's going to be the guy. CeeDee Lamb's getting double teamed or double covered, excuse me. Let's see how it goes then, and he didn't do anything. Dak Prescott gets injured. He's out for six to eight weeks. This Cowboys team is doomed. And although I predicted them not doing well, just not having an injury in mind, the injury is going to make my prediction come true because this Cowboys team is going to win a very small amount of games with whoever they have a quarterback. Unless Zeke decides to all of a sudden become 2016 Zeke, they're not going to win very many football games at all. It's going to be it's going to be a rough season for Dallas, and it's going to be pretty much a wash, which is going to be a shame because they're going to be wasting a very talented defense. So, and I think the Buccaneers off to a really good start, especially on defense. Very promising. Devin White flying around. Their corners making plays. Their pass rush making plays. The Buccaneers just look like a very solid football team. And if they can keep it up and if they can be more consistent finishing drives, and I think they will, I think they're going to figure things out and be more consistent finishing drives. If they can do that, they're going to be a good football team. So there's not much to worry about with the Buccaneers. A lot of what I thought was going to be an issue seemed to be debunked in week one. If they can continue to make me look like an idiot throughout the season, don't be worried. The Buccaneers will probably win the division. I was banking on them having struggles. And they didn't really show it a ton, although they didn't score a lot of points on the. Uh, they did, although they didn't score a lot of points, they didn't show as much of a struggle as I thought they would. Like I said, they moved the ball really well on a talented Dallas defense. So, my expectation is if they keep rolling the way they are, if they build upon what they did on Sunday night, they're probably going to win the division. Especially considering New Orleans struggled against Atlanta, although Atlanta. In Atlanta fashion, blew a 16-point lead with about 10 minutes left in the game. Who's surprised? It's, that's that's Atlanta does what Atlanta does. The Falcons are going to keep doing them, and it doesn't matter who the head coach is or who the quarterback is or yada, yada, yada. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing every year. They just can't seem to close out a f game in the fourth quarter. It's I feel for Falcons fans, it's got to be frustrating. Ever since that Super Bowl, it's just been, they've just been in complete shambles. It's 
it's a rough thing to watch. I hope I hope they get it figured out. It's a rough thing to watch. I want to see Atlanta do something. Win a fourth quarter lead for once, please, Atlanta. So I don't have to keep watching you get made fun of all over social media. It's sad. Please stop it. Um, so as far as my week one predictions and how I'm reacting to that, that's all I have for you. If you enjoyed the video, if you want to see more, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when I'm uploading new videos. Check me out on Instagram and on TikTok at The Pocket Passer. If you want to see me on other social media platforms, I'll be posting clips and stuff from these videos. If you want to see short clips, I'll be trying to get more of those out. It's been busy with homecoming and football, but my schedule should be starting to thin out a little bit, especially with homecoming coming and going. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.